Wātea Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union. Kia ora Aotearoa, welcome to Wātea Fifth Estate where we wrap the most important news events with the best political panel on television. Joining us tonight to discuss the ongoing occupation of Palestine and what New Zealand should be pushing for while we're on the UN Security Council. In studio, human rights activist Keith Locke, unionist and Palestinian rights activist Tali Williams. On Skype, Green Party foreign affairs spokesperson Kennedy Graham. And on the phone, long-time human rights activist and researcher Jan Free Wakem. Thank you for joining us, panel. And remember, viewers, you can send in questions and thoughts for tonight's show off our watianews.com and the dailyblog.nz platforms. Or you can email us at watia5e at watia603am.co.nz. Also, if you're on Twitter, our guest Twitter commentator tonight is unionist Kate Davis. You can follow her at Kate in the Bay using the hashtag watiafifthestate. Over the last week, there has been focus on the Labour Party in New Zealand and in Britain that supporters and MPs have been anti-Semitic in their criticism of Israel. But is anti-Zionism also anti-Semitic? And is the debate a tactic to distract righteous criticism of Israel's appalling and ongoing brutal occupation of Palestine? Keith, there can be no justification whatsoever for anti-Semitism. The Jewish people have suffered unacceptable historical hatred but is that what we are seeing here? Yes, we've got to fight anti-Semitism, but anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. A lot of the people who are pro the state of Israel as a Jewish state, uh, they define anyone who's against that mission as an anti-Semite. Mm. And I think that's sort of what's happening in this case yep. as well. Because in Britain you have Ken Livingstone, well-known Labour figure over there, uh, saying that Hitler supported Zionism. Well, he may be wrong about that, but it's not in and of itself anti-Semitic. No, no. Uh, it, it is true that Hitler had an agreement with some Jewish leaders in 1933 That's right. That's right. for to transfer assets mm. of Jews to Palestine because he mm. was, from his racist perspective, trying to get rid of Jews sure, from sure. The, the country. But he didn't, as far as I know, actually mm. support Zionism and an independent Jewish state. Yeah. So Livingston was wrong, mm. but he wasn't being anti-Semitic. Yeah. And he shouldn't have been suspended from the Labour Party. Are you anti-Semitic if you believe the state of Israel is treating the people of Palestine with bewildering cruelty? Is it, is it, is it, is it anti-Semitic to think that? Well, obviously mm. not. Any human rights violation should be opposed, whoever they're committed by. Yep. And that's got nothing to do with anti-Semitism. Really, when you look at and it's important to understand what Zionism is at this point, I think, that mm. Zionism is support for an independent Jewish state which was created and maintained in the territory of Israel. That's what Zionism is, and it's really a racist concept. You know, if in New Zealand, because with our values, if we said, well, we're going to set up a, a European state and giving preference to the European ethnicity and other ethnicities are effectively subordinate or secondary to that, mm. that would be a racist state. Well, that's exactly what the Zionist project is. To create, it, it created a state in that territory of Palestine uh, where the Jewish um, ethnicity has preferences mm. over the Palestinian ethnicity. Chan Free, 7,000 Palestinians are in Israeli prison, 700 without any legal rights, and at least 300 of them are children. The country is crisscrossed with checkpoints, militant Israeli settlers, and over the last 13 years, the IDF have killed a Palestinian child once every three days and injured 12 every week. At what point do we acknowledge that Israel is out of control and that criticising them isn't anti-Semitic? Well, it's been out of control for a long time, um, Bomber, and I think that it has been recognised by a great deal of um, people, particularly civilians, not necessarily governments, around the world that this kind of behaviour is um, monstrous to, to um, and particularly its treatment 
treatment of children is mm. abominable. Of course, um, to criticise it, you do have to stand up to this um, rather nasty insinuation that you are anti-Jewish for doing mm. so, but that is absolutely um, a, a, a distraction, and that's what it should be treated as. At the centre of um, any actions that we have undertaken as activists in New Zealand has been the importance of human rights of every citizen mm. of um, the territory now known as Israel and Palestine. And we should be um, um, promoting that um, effort by communities around the world who see the injustice that is being done and um, speak their outrage. And this, as you've exemplified, um, by the treatment of children is only one aspect mm. of their behaviour, which is um, unacceptable in any kind of modern, modern democratic society. Tali, you, course, you were... Th th thank you, Jeffrey. Tali, you were part of the protest group trying to break the Gaza blockade with aid. Why did you feel it was something that you need to do with direct action? Um, I guess the main problem there is that um, international governments uh, were not doing their job in ensuring that the needs of the Gazan people were met in mm. terms of the food, the medicines, the construction, material they needed to rebuild after numerous bombings from Israel. Why did you feel personally that you had to step in and put yourself in that position, though? That's, it's a hell of a thing to be sympathetic towards a cause. It's something to donate. It's something to give help to. But mm. to actually go and put yourself in that position, mm. why did you feel it was something worth that, that, that was so important for you to put, put your own life at risk? Um, personally, I didn't feel like I was putting my own life at risk. Um, but the main reason that we went over there was to show, aside from giving the aid, is to show international solidarity with the people of Gaza yeah. and show that they weren't alone and that we, in our own corner of the world, were challenging what was happening to them. Yeah. Yeah. Kennedy, New Zealand now has a place on the UN Security Council. How much leadership should New Zealand be taking in helping implement the two-state solution? Well, I think, I think New Zealand is right to place a considerable priority on the Palestine issue mm. while it's got a two-year tenure. Uh, I commend the government for that. Um, that begs the question of what policy New Zealand should be mm. developing and articulating in the council. And there's, uh, I think, uh, fundamentally, underneath the, the surface of policy, you've got to make a decision as a government, especially on the Security Council, as to whether you're going to be satisfied with a national, a very clear-sided and lucid national statement of policy as you see the solution to the crisis, Palestine-Israel yep. crisis should be, yep. on the one hand, and then just think your job is done if you make a, a clear-sighted national statement, on the one hand, and on the other hand, seeking to negotiate with, among 14 other powers or countries, or some of them major, obviously major powers, as to what the council as a whole might accept. Yep. And they are not one of the same thing. And I think you can, in fact, should have your kind of quality national policy articulated in the first instance, but then you've got a hell of a negotiating job Sure. Uh, if the consequences of your statement of policy are increasing or usually decreasing your political capital, capital for those negotiations. That's, do you think, that's do you, do, do, do you think uh, Kennedy, that the situation is, is so bad now that we simply can't believe that Israel and Palestine are able to sit down together and work this out themselves, that it actually does require the outside world to sit down here and force a solution on? Because, it, because, because you just, you, you know... We've had, what, 50 years of this, and it still continues to go on. Yeah, and you can trace it back before 50 years as well, and depending on your historical yes, length of yeah. cord, you go back thousands of years. But uh, absolutely, I don't think it's possible for the two sides, at least in the foreseeable future, to get any kind of negotiated agreement. It has to go beyond that. It has to be basically the Security Council 
I don't, I mean, personal view here, I, I think with great respect to the United States, I think the biggest problem is that the world has for some time now defaulted to the U.S. as chief negotiator. Yep. If it wasn't quartet, then it becomes the U.S. Now, um, with great respect to Israel, they're going to have to accept the fact that the U.S. can't possibly be seen as the neutral broker here. Yep. It can only be the United Nations. And I know Israel's concerns with the United Nations, but they, it, it, we will not make progress until it's accepted by Israel and everybody else that the leadership for negotiations has to come from the UN inspired leadership by the next secretary general and inspired uh, negotiator special representative but more than anything judicial settlement and part of in personal view part of that um, progress has to rest on judicial settlement keith we talk a lot in the west about winning hearts and minds of the countries that we invade uh, how does propping up an illegal occupation in palestine win hearts and minds? Well, it doesn't. And I think the problem with the UN and the Security Council is that the United States is 100% backer of Israel. Mm. And Hillary Clinton, yep. who's likely to be the Democratic nominee and possibly the president, is absolutely 100% behind Israel, wants to give it more missiles, etc., yep. etc. So that's your problem at the Security Council. That very hard to get a a good resolution through there. So while I agree with Kennedy that it'd be good if we get a consensus mm. resolution, in practice, I don't think Murray McCulley's matching up. When he last year he came up with a proposal, uh, half of which was good. That is that uh, Israel should stop the new settlements in the West Bank, mm. but the other half was that uh, the Palestinians should agree not to go to the International Criminal Court on human rights violations, which is Ridiculous. utterly wrong. And yeah. I, I read uh, Murray McCulley's speech to the Security Council last month, and he was just saying, oh, the Security Council's got to do something, do something, do something. He, really, the only progress that's going to be made is if countries acted as they did towards apartheid South Africa mm -hmm. and take action, yeah. sanctions, the, Israel has got to be punished, as South Afri the apartheid yep. South Africa state was, in order for progress to be made. Janfrey, the argument from defenders of Israel is that Palestinians who fire rockets or knife Israeli citizens deserve the group punishment they get. What would you say to that? Well, it's hard to know where to begin, but when a population has been under severe military brutal occupation for 50 years mm. since 1967 and um, their relations who fled in 1948 and 1967 refused um, to be allowed to return to join their families um, in either the, um, Gaza, the West Bank or East Jerusalem. Um, and this continual uh, oppression that um, uh, prevents them moving, like in Gaza, a siege now, which has gone on for nearly 10 years, mm. absolutely uh, that population of nearly 2 million trapped inside that very small territory, they have a right to resist uh, this occupation. Nobody criticised the um, French when the Germans were occupying uh, yeah. France during yeah. the Second World War, yeah. why shouldn't the Palestinians resist this brutal occupation? Of course, it has backfired on them, and the world media has been particularly um, unhelpful in I identifying this right to resist occupation. Mm. But um, the non-violent approach, which is going to is already producing a great deal of results through the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign is going to be a fruit and that is the most a more effective way to resist this terrible occupation we'll, that has we'll, gone we'll get on. into the BDS in just a second uh, Tali, has, has Israel's treatment of the Palestinian people reached the apartheid South African levels in that it's an issue that you can't sit on the fence post any longer on you you actually have to blame the occupiers for the violence occurring to those under occupation, don't you? Absolutely. And <clears throat> the uh, 
Jewish Israelis are treated differently yep. and afforded more rights and recognition than Arab Israelis, and that's unquestionable. Um, just for example, there are separate roads yep. um, through the through the West Bank um, for um, Isra uh, Jewish Israelis versus Arab Israelis. Who also Ara Arab Israelis are stopped by checkpoints along yep. the way. They can't move freely. Yep. They can't move in and out of the country freely, whereas um, Jewish Israelis can. Yep. So there's no question that there is a different system um, for the two. Kennedy, how many recruits for extremism? Does the brutality of the occupation against the people of Palestine help generate? I mean, isn't it a, a counterproductive uh, uh, occupation? Well, obviously it generates uh, grievance and a lot more terrorism in response. Yeah. And the, 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 there are equations that people throw around for that formula. Um, that doesn't seem to fa be factored in in terms of Israeli strategic policy. Right. They probably make the judgment that, yes, they're aware of that. Uh, and with the iron fist, they're going to contain it. Uh, that's probably their their approach. Um, that's setting aside any issues of morality and and, and international law. Yeah. But that could be their their, their approach. Um, I don't think I don't think for a second that the Security Council is about to um, settle this issue uh, in the context of 24 months and of New Zealand's tenure, uh -huh. nor because of New Zealand's tenure. I think it's going to take a hell of a lot longer time. But I don't see any alternative to the Security Council ultimately enforcing the or authorizing and enforcing whatever settlement comes down the track. Yeah. Because if you don't, then you're leaving it, you're, you're crabbing back to basically almost pre-multilateral kind of 19th century major power diplomacy. And that's no longer in the universalism of the 21st century that you can't do that. Can so we have no choice but to strengthen the council yep. and just work away at it. Po probably post New Zealand's tenure. How how tenable is Israel's position though uh, moving forward? At at some point, their occupation of of, of Palestinian land, yeah. it, it it just can't continue. I mean, they do understand and accept that, don't they? No, I don't think they do. Uh, back to the iron fist of the strategic policy. Um, there are those, as you probably know, in Israel and and outside Israel who argue that the, quote, occupied territories, um, the ICJ talks about occupied territory. Yep. The Security Council talks about occupied territories. Most of the world recognise it as um, Palestinian territory that is occupied by Israeli. Yep. A lot of Israelis argue that it is simply, quote, disputed territory. Right. And look at the settlements, look at the wall. Um, they're in for the long haul. Yeah. And they know that they've got buying time with US backing. And un as long as they've got that U.S. backing, they're not going to change their strategic policy. Keith, what is what is BDS a, 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 as a movement, and do you think it's effective? BDS is boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Mm. That is um, putting a wall around Israel, really, and expressing. Yeah, it's it's a way of punishing Israel for its policies. Yep. Putting economic pressure the way that sanctions put economic pressure on apartheid South Africa. Yep. And it's a grassroots campaign around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, some companies and to a degree countries have bought into it. Yep. Uh, there have been some successes, like Veolia, which runs the trains in That's Auckland right. That's and right. soon in Wellington. Yep. It's uh, divested out of uh, Israel, yep. as all the Israeli companies, um, because of their involvement in the settlements. What about my KiwiSaver account? Is my KiwiSaver account going to any of this? Well. Not so much the Kiwi Saver, but the super fund you know, right. that the government uh, accumulates, yeah. or national suspended, yeah, yeah. It, that in theory, that big super fund's got billions of dollars in yep. it. Uh, that has uh, sold out of uh, three corporations that are involved in construction in the settlements. That good, was good. quite a victory for the BDS yep. in New Zealand. Yep. And the movement continues, and, yeah. and it has to, because things are getting worse. It's not only, as Kennedy said, you know, the settlements and uh, the wall and things like that. One thing that struck me is a year or so ago they passed a law in Israel yep. that if an Israeli, usually a Palestinian, uh, wanted to marry a Palestinian in yeah. occupied territories, they couldn't bring their spouse back to live in Israel. You know, at, at the same time as any New Zealand person of Jewish origin, origin mm. can go to Israel tomorrow yep. and live there as long as they like. Yeah, 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 so yeah, yeah. that is 
fundamental racism. Yes. And that can't be accepted. Jamfrey, what more should the boycott, divest, uh, divestment and sanction movement target in New Zealand, do you think? Well, uh, it, it, they've suggested many uh, fronts. There's a sporting boycott, of course, which yes. we're familiar with. And we protested at the ASB tennis tournament in 2010 yes. and, and succeeded in stopping Israeli Shahapir from returning to New Zealand. There's a cultural boycott, which is associated with um, a boycott or seeking uh, uh, organisations in New Zealand to prevent uh, inviting um, Israelis who are, um, per, for instance, a Jerusalem quartet playing here in New Zealand. Yep. And we protested the Batsheva Dance Company um, and it, it, when they performed in New Zealand. These are the sorts of things. There's an academic boycott um, and there's the economic um, sanctions that we can look to too. So there are all sorts of ways um, that we can... Um, Israeli goods that are... Uh, manufactured, mm -hmm. particularly those manufactured in the occupied territories in the West Bank, um, like Soda Stream, we've had actions against them, but mm -hmm. there are many more that we can um, challenge. And Jennifer, we will... what, do you, what, do you say to, what do you say to those who would challenge you and say, well, by, by, by pulling out of those areas economically, the only people who are really going to get hurt are the Palestinians who require that, that, that employment? Well, it's a very seductive sort of argument, yes. but we are heartened by the call of the Palestinian civil society yep. representing 125 or 150 organisations who said in spite of the privations that uh, sanctions will um, impose on us, please continue, and that is our only hope, yeah. as I... Uh, um, agree with Kennedy and with um, uh, Keith that the UN has been useless at trying to prevent um, Israeli war crimes, basically. And, oh, hold on, Jennifer, um, yeah, yeah, go for Keith, yeah. yeah. With the BDS, it's not against Israeli Jews. I think that's important. It's yep. against the Israeli government. Yep. And quite a lot of Israeli Jews support the boycott. The only yep. thing is that uh, they can get penalised in Israel for supporting a boycott yeah. of uh, Israeli products. Uh, Tali, can people at home who are watching this right now, can they really make a difference? Um, I think the way that we can make the biggest difference in New Zealand is by supporting the international boycott divestment sanctions campaign from our corner of the world um, and also um, making sure that we are pressuring the New Zealand government to play its role mm -hmm. in pressuring Israel um, to abide by international law, mm -hmm. as it should have done many years ago, um, and yeah, continue that. Kennedy, what kind of political leadership is needed to get Israel to end their illegal occupation? What, 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 what do you think it's going to take? Well, it's two things. I mean, back to New Zealand, we do need to show some leadership in getting our policy right. Yep. And uh, we should go more for recognition. Uh, I put a notice of motion in the House, or I tried, to have New Zealand recognise Palestine. It was yep. voted. I wasn't even granted leave by the government to do so. But that's happening around the world. Yep. Um, I think the earlier comment a moment ago about um, international law is critical. I think we need, personally, that the New Zealand and the Security Council should put an emphasis on judicial settlement. Yep. Not just an advisory opinion on the wall, but advisory opinion on everything. Territories, settlements, uh, status of Jerusalem, repatriation, uh, status of um, uh, religious sites. Yep. yep. And then, then you've got a legal opinion on which politically <clears throat> the leadership through the Security Council and the General Assembly uh, as a whole can be applied. That'll take five to ten years. Yep. But I don't see another way. Do you, do, w w at what point do you see America finally saying no to Israel in terms of the billions of dollars in military aid? Or are they just too invested? Do they, do they make too much money out of it to show any real well, leadership? You know, I mean, they've got their investments all around the world. I'm not sure that Israel is, in quantitative terms, critical to them. It's more political. Right. And, and historical yeah. and almost emotional to them. 
Right. But I don't, and I don't think there's a magic uh, silver bullet to, to change that. Uh -huh. But if you look at the history of apartheid, there was a certain change at one stage on the part of the UK. Um, yep. yep. And uh, if you look at the, if you look at the, go back earlier and you look at uh, Suez and Egypt, yep. UK, New Zealand, Australia were in the wrong, US was pushing it uh, constructively. These we things have, can happen, and yep. there are sometimes there are just breakthrough points that you're not aware of. Yep. You just have to keep on pushing. Thank you. Uh, we have to wrap the show, but before we go, we'll do a quick final word with our panellists. Will we see a free Palestine in our lifetime? Jan Free. I hope so. Keith. I, I think so. I, I know that we saw a free South Africa. We saw a free East Timor. Things can happen very quickly once you get to a tipping point and the world wakes up. Tali? I think we have a proud history of challenging apartheid um, the world over and we can do the same here. Absolutely. Kennedy? Potentially yes, we can. I just make the point that uh, any of the crisis spots around the world are going to have extra pressure because of climate change and resource depletion. That's going to make, the 21st century is going to be tough. It's still within our power to do so. Thank you, panel. And to my final word, the terrible conditions that Palestinians have been forced to endure under a cruel and sadistic occupation is as damaging to the Israeli people as it is to the Palestinians. Our inability to force Israel to the peace table in a meaningful way is one of the great shames of the UN. I've lived to say, see Nelson Mandela be freed and voted in as president of South Africa. I've lived to see the Berlin Wall fall down and I've lived to see an African-American become president of the United States of America. I hope to live to see a free Palestine and functioning two-party state, but it will take people power to provide a clear signal to Israel that without a two-state solution, we can't in good conscience interact with them economically, culturally or academically. Thank you, panellists. Thank you, Fano, for watching. We'll join you again tomorrow night, 7pm, for Wātia Fifth Estate. Kia ora and good night. Wātia Fifth Estate is brought to you by ACU, the Aotearoa Credit Union.